like to talk to you today about how we can't keep letting racist people lie to us about our history and say it's a critical race theory because these snowflakes are too sensitive and can't handle the reality that United States history has always been ugly and you just have to get used to that, learn from it, and move on. Like, well, children do. You weak-willed snowflakes. Once upon a time, there was a boat in Virginia. This boat was filled with slaves. They came from Mali, Ghana, and the Ivory Coast. This boat was listed as a used boat of slaves because the man who was selling the boatload of human beings had already had his fun with, with what he wanted to do, and now he wanted to get out of this. On that boat, there was a woman, we believe from either Mali or Ghana. She had with her a child who was about 12. This child was listed as a mulatto, meaning that the child was half black and half white. The child was the child of the man selling her. Two individuals purchased everybody off of the boat. Their names were Frederick Craig Stein and William Craig. No relation, just BFFs. One was from Germany. Willie, Willie Boy there was from Scotland. Now, after a while, Frederick Craig Stein decided he did not want to be a slave owner. Didn't see black folks as people, but didn't want to be a slave owner either. Made him squeamy. So he sold his half to William Craig, who took those slaves from Virginia down through Georgia and into Alabama, where he went to a timeshare sort of situation with a plantation called the Washington Jones Plantation. It's one of at least nine plantations that Alabama has mysteriously lost the records of. And no jokes, there's a Starbucks where, the, where it used to be. Now, from the time he went from Virginia to the point where he landed that buggy in Bessemer, Alabama... That 12-year-old baby girl that he had purchased, he had his way with. From that union came a baby girl named Amanda, but in a lot of records, her name comes up as Mandy. Now, although he acknowledged this was his daughter, he would not let this daughter near him, would not let this child live in his home. Left this child some things when he passed away, but that was about as far as that father-daughter relationship was going to go because, you know, not all the way right. Now, Amanda was said to be a high yellow quadroon. That's somebody like me. That's somebody who's got some black in that DNA, but in certain situations, they, they could pass as, you know, racially nondescript. In her case, where her hair was light, her eyes were light, she had freckles, she could have passed for white. Back in those days, a slave that could pass for white was considered an extreme commodity. A lot of people would sell them off as sex gifts, because isn't it so funny? They look like one of us, but it's really one of them. Ha ha ha. Racist people were like that. Nothing has changed. I'm sorry to tell you this about history. This was racist, by the way. Did I mention it was racist? Because it was horrifyingly racist. Moving forward. The people who took over the plantation after William Craig died, didn't want their investment to walk up off the plantation. So by gunpoint, they forcibly mated her and the blackest man on the plantation, telling them, if you don't do what we want you to, we will shoot you both. This resulted in them eventually finding love with each other because they realized they're both victims of the same crime. It also resulted in uh, the birth of a baby girl named Johanna and later on the birth of a baby boy. Now, slavery, we're told in school, ended in 1865. Kind of yes and kind of no. Not every state wanted to ratify 100% the end of slavery. Putting things into perspective, you can Google this. Mississippi didn't want to jump on board till 2013. Throwing that out there. So Alabama didn't want to jump on board until December of 1865. Christmas present for everybody, right? Well, after, uh, you know, slavery was officially done in Alabama, the folks at the Washington Jones Plantation thought it would be funny to take advantage of the fact that they did not allow their slaves to learn how to read. Back in those days, if you were caught learning how to read, they could shoot you. You notice how racists don't want you to read? Racists want you to stay stupid? You notice that, right? Yeah, things don't change, do they? 
Anywho, they thought that their slaves were not going to understand things like emancipation, which is a very big word. So they took advantage of that and they illegally sold Johanna's little brother after slavery was one more time all done with in that state. Johanna was 12 and extremely smart and also extremely tall for her age. And she used that power. She fought through the wilderness, led a search party, retrieved her baby brother, found out her baby brother, who was a kindergartner, by the way, kindergarten age. Baby brother was about to be put on a farm where they would have had him handle heavy machinery, put him in heavy, hard labor, which would have killed him because, again, this was a kindergarten age child. She found this out, found the man who illegally purchased her baby brother, got this man to find the truth that this was an illegal sale, you've been swindled out of your money, slavery's done with, get, get away from this baby boy. When she and her mother and father and the baby boy came back to retrieve the last of their belongings, they found the plantation had been set on fire, records first. Why records first? Because the men who had the plantation figured, if we cannot keep you, we'll keep your history from you. And that's what they were told. Johanna, 12 years old, fought through the flames, retrieved the last of their belongings, and they skedaddled to start their brand new life. Not long after this, Johanna met a Native American man. His name has been lost to history. Somewhere after their union, somewhere after she became pregnant with their child, he disappears from history. For generations, it, it was thought that he must have bailed because she was pregnant. Not so. The same exact time he disappears, there was a bad lynching in Alabama. A lot of Native American men were lynched. A lot of Native American men were set on fire. There were shallow graves, and there were men hanging from trees. We have reason to suspect one of those shallow graves is where he currently is. He's been lost to time, and that's the best we can find. After he goes missing forever... She has a baby boy named Eli. Eli grows up the first generation in this family born free. That means he is not born a slave. He's born a regular American citizen like everybody else today. He is a hardworking man. He provides for his family. Unfortunately, he ends up passing away somewhere in his 40s because he died a firefighter. He was impaled by a telephone pole while he was rescuing the last child out of a build, burning building a f belonging to a family that would have otherwise not given him the time of day had it not been for the fact that their house was ablaze and he was saving their lives. Now, he had several children. The youngest child was a woman named Emma Lois. And Emma Lois was also a hardworking individual, adopted that from her father, she had a very hard life. When she was a single mother, she met a man named Shedrick Bonner, who himself was descendant of slaves, also from Bessemer, Alabama. That's kind of fun. They didn't meet in the same area, but they, their ancestors came from same town, different plantations. That's fun. They had a very handsome baby boy named Ernest. Unfortunately, they didn't get to raise that baby right away because, you know, World War II was a thing. So one had to go fight the Nazis and s protect our, our country. The other, I believe, was working at Lockheed. So he had to go be raised by extended family in California until they were able to be discharged and go back, start over. That boy had a very difficult life. He had to grow up during the days of Jim Crow. He had to grow up during the days where it was perfectly fine to randomly assault people for being the wrong skin color on the wrong side of the street. A lot to take in as a small child, you know? But he had to grow up in this world. When he was a young man, he went to Germany. And while he was in the military, he met a lovely lady named Carla. And from that union came my mother. And my mother had a very difficult upbringing. My mother had to grow up during the 1960s, during the whole civil rights movement, where we had grown adults threatening her because she was half and half. Not very fun. 
She had to go to high school, grow up in a situation where a lot of boys were like, Oh, I would date you, but I don't know what my friends would think. Oh. Grow up in an environment where it was considered perfectly okay to walk up to little girls and call them abominations for being mixed race. So dating pool was real shallow. That's why she ended up with my dad. And I grew up. I grew up in the 90s. And you might think, Racism's over! <laughs> no, it was not. People didn't know because my skin color changes a lot. When I'm at my best health, my skin color is a deep gold to remind me of the riches that were stolen from my ancestors. And when I'm not getting enough sleep, like today I'm running off of three hours of sleep, I look very pale. A lot like Amanda. You don't know what I could pass as, could you? Ha <laughs> ha! Real fun. Because I grew up ethnically nondescript, a lot of people didn't know how to, how to pigeonhole me, how to cubbyhole me, how to describe me. So to tell them the truth, I'm mixed, I'm more than one race, and people would flip out on me. And people also would flip out because I was an avid reader as a child. I would read a lot about history. Specifically, I would read about the time period my ancestors came from because I wanted to know why did this happen? Why were my ancestors slaves? And why did it take so long for people to decide that's a bad idea? And why did we have Jim Crow and why do we still have to put up with this? Why do we still have redlining in certain areas? People would get mad at me for asking those questions. And I noticed that unfortunately, those people have power now. Those people are in Congress. And I can't help but notice that those people who don't want you to read sound an awful lot like the people who didn't want Johanna to read or Amanda to read. Those people who thought it would be funny to slip things by them on the press, pre premises that they were hopeful that Johanna could not read, that Johanna could not process large words like emancipation so that they could illegally take her little brother from her. Those people have descendants who are in Congress right now who don't want you to acknowledge the fact that slavery and Jim Crow and redlining and civil rights, they're not a critical race theory. There is no theory. It's a, th it's a fact. The faster you accept that reality, the faster you evolve, but they don't want you to evolve. They hate the fact that you're woke because they want you to be asleep forever so they can slip stuff by you like they tried to slip past Johanna like they tried to fool a 12 year old baby girl into thinking it was okay for them to take her little brother in the night that really bothers me that bothers me a lot not only does it bother me that these these rules these laws they're being passed without a vote they're being passed without the voice of the people saying yay or nay to it they're they're being passed without our vote they're being passed even though most of us are like, hey, stop censoring the, the history books. We don't want our movies censored. We don't want our cartoons censored. We don't want our anime censored. So obviously, we don't want video games or history censored. The people who cry about, my free speech is attacked because you told me not to say a bad word, are the same people voting for these people who want to censor stuff. They only care about free speech when they go after your transgender child but they suddenly don't care about free speech when you have to have your child learn about actual history in school. That really disturbs me. What disturbs me more is there's a lot of boomers and Gen Xers who are not disturbed by that. There, these are a lot of people who are absolutely okay with these folks passing laws without their vote, without their voice, without their say, because I don't want to be a libtard. I don't want to vote for anything but red. Oh, I'll vote for a libertarian. Oh, they're Republican now. Oh, that's fun. There's a lot of people who are choosing parties because they're afraid of being labeled as too liberal or woke, but they're not afraid of losing their history. What disturbs me with that is that when you censor history, and you don't learn from history, it repeats itself. And we see it repeating itself. We see it repeating itself a lot. I want you to Google sometime how many kids are in the foster care system who were not abused, not neglected, not being starved out, 
but came from families who were either the wrong economical bracket or the wrong skin color or the wrong immigration status. You're going to be very amazed. There's a lot of stuff being slipped past you. And people are more focused on not being a liberal boo-hoo-hoo and not so much focused on where they should be. The same people who tried to take the history away from my ancestors are trying to take your history away from you, regardless of your color. Even if you're white, you are going to be suffering on the same level as the rest of us because your history is being stolen. Folks, there, it's, not a, uh, it's not a theory, it's a fact. Please accept that reality. Please accept the fact that it's always been a fact. Yes, United States history is very ugly. United States history is not pretty. There's a lot of horrible things that, that a lot of our ancestors have done that are inexcusable. We all have at least one ancestor who was a complete screw-up. Mine was William Craig. He couldn't leave baby girls alone, and that's where we came from. He bought into a plantation. He bought into slavery. He was a screw-up. All right? That's not cool to learn that your, your fifth great-grandfather was a screw-up, but you got to accept that reality, right? I've accepted that reality a long time ago. We had screwed-up things happen in history. The point of learning about it isn't to make you feel sad about yourself or bad because of who you are. The point of learning from history is so you learn what went wrong so you don't do it again. And this is the problem. We're going to end up at a point where we're not learning from history and it will happen again. And I don't want to see that happen. And if you're a real American, you shouldn't want that either. So thanks for listening. It's not a theory, it's a fact. Learn to deal with it.